Good morning. You ever answer someone with, you too, just automatically? Happy Father's Day. That would be okay. I almost said it to a woman this morning. You too. You too. <laughs> oh, we need you. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. If you're not new here among us, you know that I was not here last week. So I want to thank the body of Christ, the participating members here who make it possible for us to get some much needed rest, the staff and Ed, who delivered a great message last week. I look forward to seeing more of Ed in the future. He is great. If you're not new here among us, you can probably guess where I went on vacation. There's a running joke. We only go to Disney. If you want to find me, you can look at my house, a couple of local pizza places here, the church, or Disney. That's where I am. That's it. Those are the only places we go. We've added Miami to the list, so now you've got a 50-50 shot of guessing if you guys are taking bets. But we love Disney. And it's not about Mickey Mouse. I was describing it to someone this morning. They own like a whole county in each theme park or like multiple cities. You could just stay at one of the resorts there, and that's it. You don't have to go into the park. They have multiple restaurants. It's pretty amazing. It's a fascinating place. So for us, it's more than just the rides, the amusement park rides. It's about the food, as Ed noted, the pizza. Via Napoli and Epcot Center makes like the best pizza in the whole world. If you're new here among us, you probably already know everything you need to know about me. I love pizza. It's an important part of my life. Speaking of rides, is there anyone else here besides me who is afraid of certain rides? If you're being honest, do certain rides cause you a little anxiety? Like, no thanks, I don't want to go on that one. Now, most of the rides at Disney are pretty tame, like Space Mountain. All right? If you've ever seen that roller coaster with the lights on, you might be embarrassed that you were ever afraid of it because it's actually like a kiddie coaster. It's just in the dark, so it makes it feel like it's doing more than it really is. Now, I don't mind roller coasters for the most part. What I do mind is plummeting. I don't like plummeting. I don't like heights, but I don't like drops. I discovered this in my early to mid-20s. A group of me and my friends, we went to Disney World, and we came upon the Tower of Terror. Now, right there, it's telling you, you should be afraid of it. It's in the title, right? So I don't know any people who are, well, sane and say, terror is a feeling that I really want to experience today. Today, I'd like more terror in my life. If that's you, we can schedule an appointment, and I'll see you in my office this week. <laughs> Terror, right? But I'm with my friends, right? So I don't want to say, eh, I don't think so today. 
No, I go on the ride, and at first it's okay. It's all seemed like 1920s hotel or something like that. They got the bellhops. Everyone's in character. They're really good at that at Disney. You go on it. There's an elevator, and at first it's kind of like your average dark ride. Everything's okay until, boom, the doors open up, and you are at the top of this building. You can see Jerusalem from there. <laughs> You're at the pinnacle and you plummet. It drops you several times in random sequence so you can't prepare for it ever again or figure it out. I was a little bit terrified. I got off the ride. I was okay. Everything was fine. Somebody in the group asked, do you want to do it again? I said, no, nah, I'm good. Let's do Dumbo. So <clears throat> I was good until I got home that evening and tried to go to sleep. And I felt like I was on the Tower of Terror over and over and over and over again. Apparently, I have a bad equilibrium, vertigo, something like that. So now, when we go there and someone asks me if I want to go on the Tower of Terror, I say, no thanks. And I am happy to wait for you in the gift shop of shame. <laughs> well, just wait there. I don't care. Now, my wife and daughter, they don't have this problem, so they can go on all the rides, and I wait in a lot of gift shops. This is what happens, right? There's the rock and roller coaster. That's a little crazy, too. I don't, want, I don't need to experience that. <laughs> so I'll wait for them in the gift shop of shame, but they're not scared of too much at Disney. But I think it's safe to say that my wife doesn't like a certain ride. I'm not going to say that she's afraid. Only God knows what's in her heart. And so that's not for me to judge. He doesn't like dinosaur, the dinosaur ride. He does not like it. Now, if you've never been on it, I'll briefly explain this to you. It's really cool. I think it's a really cool ride because of the ride vehicle. It not only just doesn't just go on a track, it goes everywhere. So it moves you around like you're really going over the terrain and the wilderness and everything. The premise is that you're being shot back in time to when a meteor is about to hit the earth and destroy everything, the time of the dinosaurs, right? And you're supposed to save this baby iguanodon or something like that. Yes, I got the dinosaur name right. And so you're going around and they build a lot of excitement, all right? We're not going to make it! We're not going to make it! No, they're, they're timing. It's a really short ride. 90 seconds! You're not going to make it! You know, so we're, we're looking for this thing. There's dinosaurs, and it's not too bad. It's dark, but they're not too close to you yet. And then maybe, you know, 60 seconds, da, 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 we're not going to make it. Pterodactyl comes a little too close, and then we're stuck. And all of a sudden, like Tower of Terror, you get the reveal, right? <laughs> this dinosaur is on you. It's huge. The first time I went on the ride, I got off the ride, and I was like, I could smell what it had for breakfast. <laughs> it smelled like Captain Crunch and people. <laughs> it's really invasive, if we're being honest. It's kind of scary and big, but I'm used to it now. My wife does not like it. She doesn't feel the same way. So she's built in <laughs> shields for herself to deal with this ride. She doesn't want to say, I'll wait for you in the gift shop. Now, she knows at the moment this reveal happens, they take a picture of you. Right? So that's a problem. What are you going to do? You know, you, you know, we, we play around. Me and Sophie were ah, at the dinosaur, so we think it's funny. Because in the gift shop, they have all the pictures of what you look like at this reveal. Right? And you can buy them. We're too cheap. We just take pictures of the picture. But now they have things over it, like Disney, you know, don't, don't take pictures of the picture. Actually give us money. So anyway, this is in the gift shop of shame. And you can see how silly everybody looked. Glad I didn't do it. But we prepare for it. Sophie and I know. Heather also prepares for it. What she does is she makes sure that she's on the opposite side of the ride vehicle and I'm right under the dinosaur. That's one. That's her first, you know, shield wall of people that she sets up for herself. The other one is quite clever. Quite clever. She has what I like to call another shield. And it's not like the Ephesians 6 kind of shield of faith. It's kind of the opposite. I refer to it as the hair shield of fear. Very interesting. If you know Heather, you know she puts her hair up a lot. If she's at work, she does it with the pencils and stuff like that, but I don't think they allow the pencils in Disney World. Maybe they saw John Wick. We'll move on. She uses hair clips 
right? And I like them because they're like dinosaurs, so she doesn't allow me to play with them anymore. Rawr. So she puts them in her hair, but before she gets on this ride, that hair clip comes out. And she does like the superhero move, all right? And I can hear the Wonder Woman theme song playing. She gets her hair ready, puts the clip on her bag. At the moment in which the ride vehicle gets stuck, she goes, boop, forward. And of course, the hair shields her face. You can't see it. Now, I'm told that this time, Heather was strong and courageous. She said, I didn't hide myself this time. Well, we got off the ride, and mysteriously, little picture things were out of order. Now, a little conspiracy theory, you can read about it on the internet, but I think she was on her phone texting Dustin and asking him to hack <laughs> the photo machine before the ride. But I'm told she was strong and courageous. Speaking of strong and courageous, some of you know where I'm going. Today we're going to be in the book of Joshua. We're going to do the whole thing, so we'll get out of here about two or three o'clock. I'm just kidding. Try to get you out of here for food afterwards. We fellowship and eat together. We're in a series called The Rest of the Story, if you're new. And this is where we're looking at parts of the Bible that sometimes aren't really talked about a whole lot, kind of like the rare stuff or the hidden stuff. If you've ever done the story as a church, if you've been in church for a while, they leave out a lot. So we're really concentrating on that stuff and kind of reviewing the typical stories that are told in church just to get to the full counsel of God's word. We're connecting a lot of dots. Today, we will connect a lot of dots. Uh, two weeks ago, so Ed's was a standalone, we were in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy where we were wandering the wilderness with the Israelites. We see that Moses dies, the people 20 years old and older are not allowed to go to the promised land flowing with milk and honey. Why? Because of their sin and disobedience. They scouted out the land. 10 of the 12 people that scouted out were too scared. They didn't trust the Lord. So fine, you will all die in this wilderness after wandering for 40 years. Moses, he's disobedient. He strikes the rock in anger instead of speaking to it so that the water comes out. So we saw that Moses died. And now he has a successor. So at the end of Deuteronomy, we read this, Deuteronomy 34, 9. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him, doing just as the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua is an interesting book. About half of it is concerned with the allocation the division of the land, right? So the, all these promises are made previously in the previous books. Now we are in the fulfillment of it. So it's almost like repeating itself a little, but they're actually doing it. And so you get to a place in Joshua's about halfway through where there's a lot of names. And this is where a lot of people, for being honest, quit because it's just a whole list of a bunch of names or so it seems that we can't pronounce. Very, very difficult. So it's kind of like numbers. Remember, we are talking about that, where numbers can be very difficult because it's the registration of all these different people. Very monotonous, if we're being honest. But the cool thing about Joshua is it also has stories that are easy to remember, these accounts, but they're front-loaded. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to take you through these stories Briefly, I'll be like a tour guide stopping the ride vehicle at certain points and pointing things out to you. But we won't talk about dinosaurs. <laughs> so, the beginning of Joshua, this is what the Lord says to him. Joshua 1.6, Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you so we see the typical theme there. You've been in church for a long time. You'd say the theme of Joshua is be strong and courageous. Fair enough. In the Lord. We'll look at that today. So here what they're going to start doing is they're going to start preparing 
for the conquest of this promised land. They're going to cross the River Jordan, and then they're going to conquer the land for themselves as the Lord promised them. We're going to see that the Lord is fighting for them. But first, they prepare. So you're going to see in the book of Joshua some practical preparation and some spiritual preparation. So it's not one or the other. It's a little bit of both. So first, Joshua sends out two spies to spy out the first city that they're going to conquer. The Lord's going to conquer for them. Jericho. You probably know that story. We'll go over it briefly today. He sends out the spies. The king there gets word of it. He's looking for them. They end up at Rahab's house. Rahab is a prostitute. The king approaches her. She says, yeah, they've been here, but they took off. Maybe you can go catch up with them. But she's hidden them on the top of her house underneath some flax. She goes and approaches them. Everybody hears about these crazy things that are going on. God is fighting for them. So she wants some kind of security. Hey, I saved you essentially. So what are you going to do? What kind of pledge? Well, we'll pledge with our own lives. We won't harm you. Okay, great. So her house is kind of a part of the wall of Jericho. And she lets them down the wall with this scarlet rope. And they say, well, keep that rope dangling from the windows. We know where you are in there. Keep all you and your family in the house. You won't be killed. Okay, fine. Now, maybe a Bible study will get into it. There's an interesting story about Rahab. She actually connects to Ruth and she makes it into Jesus' genealogy, a story of redemption in there. Very, very interesting. So worth noting. So we keep going and now they're going to cross the river Jordan. Now this should remind you of the Exodus with Moses. It's kind of like that, but a little different. No one's pursuing them this time. So the Levites, these are like the priests, just say for short, they bring the Ark of the Covenant into the river and it stops up so that they can pass through on dry ground. And they do so. They get some memorial stones out of the river, 12 of them. They set them up so that everyone, your children, will remember what the Lord did for you. Today, the ark leaves, the waters overflow the banks of the Jordan River again. They reestablish the covenant, the covenant with the Lord. So this whole time, the uh, younger people hadn't been getting circumcised. So they got to do that now. Again, preparation for these victories. So we see they get flint knives and they're circumcised to prepare themselves. They heal up. They celebrate Passover. There's no more manna, bread from heaven. Now the land will give them that provision. So we see they start eating from the land. Again, it's all in preparation for these successive battles. We even see a little more fulfillment. There was some foreshadowing to come. Moses in the burning bush, if you remember. In Exodus 3, he's approached by the Lord. The same thing about Ish is said to Joshua. It's an angel of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army. He says, take off your sandals for this is holy ground. Same thing that was said to Moses. So there's a little full circle going on right there. And now we get to Jericho. So a few things about Jericho. You cross the River Jordan, and Jericho is really close. That's like basically the first city there. They're kind of going to travel west, northwest a little bit, and we'll see some more battles. So the thing about Jericho, the main point, is that the Lord is securing the victory, not them. So there are very specific instructions to show that the Lord is doing it. So you have the Levites, again, carrying the ark. You have the priests, seven priests with the ram's horns, the trumpets, blowing the trumpets in front of it, soldiers on the front and back in this procession. And they're told they are to walk or march around the city one time a day. You go around, don't speak, don't say anything. Just the ram's horns going around the city for six days. Then the seventh day, go around it seven times and then shout, the walls will come down. Sure enough, they do. The Lord does it. But here's the thing. It's a tithe to the Lord. We have an offering video that mentions this, the plays, I don't think it's going to play today, but they make a pretty good point. It's the first city and they're to just not plunder anything. They have to destroy everything. A certain amount of like the gold and silver, that can go in the Lord's treasury, but everything else gets destroyed. You're not to take 
anything for yourself. And so this concept is in the law of Moses, the idea of a tithe, the first fruits. You're giving the first of everything to the Lord, acknowledging that it's because of him. And so we do this practice, no, we're not under the law of Moses, in church today. I tithe, I give 10% of my paycheck before I get it. It's a pledge. I'm saying to God, putting my money where my mouth is, that it's not mine. It's his because of him. So again, this is the theme, even in the tithe, it's all because of the Lord. It has nothing to do with what the Israelites are doing. If you remember the blessings and the curses, there's the rest of the Jericho story here. We see that Joshua curses the city of Jericho. It's kind of interesting because a lot of people never talk about it and then they never notice what happens later. He puts a curse on it. He says the oldest son, essentially, of the person who lays the city's foundations again. Basically, he'll die. The youngest uh, son of the person who raises the gates will die. And it connects. We'll see it in the rest of the story to give you a little glimpse into this. We see it in 1 Kings chapter 16. You may have heard, even if you've never read it, about Ahab and Jezebel, right? Jezebel's not usually a good name for a woman. It connotates something. But these are these evil people, evil king and queen. They're in like a civil war now. They're in Samaria. And there's this guy, Hiel, who decides he's going to build the city of Jericho, rebuild it. And sure enough, his oldest son dies, his youngest son dies, and it mentions Joshua there. So that's a pretty long way out. A lot of these things come full circle. The point is only through their faithful obedience did the Lord cause these victories. But now there's AI. So if you keep traveling and you go a little northwest, they're going to run into this city AI. It's right near Bethel. Bethel's just right near. A lot of you know what that is, formerly Luz. They lose the battle. They again scout it out, the guys come back, and they say, eh, two, three thousand guys should be enough to do this. We're going to win. Okay. So they do it, and they get chased away. Thirty-six of them or so die. And now they're praying to the Lord before the Ark of the Covenant. Why, Lord? Why did this happen? The Lord answers, because one of you wasn't so obedient. Apparently, there's a guy named Achan. During Jericho, he had taken some stuff for himself. So now they have him killed. He's stoned and then burned to death along with all his stuff and his family. Remember, though, they were told, don't keep any of this stuff for yourself. So now that they've purified themselves in this way, they can now defeat AI. Again, practical and spiritual. The Lord does say, set up an ambush. They're going to do something a little different this time. But Joshua... Make sure he takes not 3,000 guys this time, (laughs) 30,000. So he's going to make sure they win. Takes 30,000 people with him. But then 5,000 wait between Bethel and Ai on the side. And they're going to set up an ambush. So Joshua is going to take the main army out. He knows the king is going to see him. Ah, we'll defeat him again. And they're going to chase him out. They pretend like they're retreating so that everybody leaves the city of Ai. And then the ambush happens. They destroy the city. And now AI is surrounded. And now they can plunder. It's no longer a tithe. They can take some of the stuff for themselves. We see the fulfillment here of what we talked about two weeks ago, the blessings and curses. Remember we talked about that theme that occurred all the way from Balak and Balaam through Deuteronomy. We looked at Deuteronomy 27 and 8, the blessings and the curses. And they were just instructions. They weren't happening then. Here's where they do it. On Mount Ebel, Mount Gerizim, they proclaim the blessings and curses or curses and blessings for what will happen to them for not being disobedient. Joshua says this, 834. Joshua then read to them, All the blessings and curses Moses had written in the book of instruction. Every word of every command that Moses had ever given was read to the entire assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. Take note of that. Every word of every command was read to them. And you guys say, I use a lot of scriptures. Well, that's interesting. We see that they're tricked. People in the land are so scared. The Gibeonites are very afraid. They know what's going on. If you look at a map, 
The Gibeonites live pretty close to Ai. They're just a little bit, I think, southwest from there, not far. But they pretend that they've come from a land far, far away. So they get dressed up in rags, and they have stale bread with them, and they pretend like they've gone on this long journey, like, this bread was fresh when we left, and now it's all moldy and rotten. And so they say, make a treaty with us. They're no threat. Well, the Israelites do. But here's the problem. They were told back in Exodus, after the Ten Commandments, three chapters later, don't make any treaties with anyone. The main point here is they're going to lead you to idolatry. You're going to worship their God, so don't do that. Well, they don't consult with the Lord, and so they end up breaking one of his commands. Despite this, Israel secures more and more and more victories, all by the Lord's power. That is the point here. Big theme in the book of Joshua. Lord, make sure people know it. Hail comes down on some of their enemies. The sun stands still at one point. While Joshua is killing five of the southern kings, he tells the Israelites, Joshua 10, 25, don't ever be afraid or discouraged, Joshua told his men. Be strong and courageous for the Lord is going to do this to all your enemies. Again, the Lord does it. Why? Important point many people miss. Joshua eleven fifteen. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did as he was told, carefully obeying all the commands that the Lord had given to Moses. And so they were able to defeat giants. The, the descendants of Anak, this is the reason the 10, 10 of the 10, or 12 scouts were afraid. They saw giants. We were like grasshoppers to them, they said. And they thought the same thing. They were too afraid. They didn't trust in the Lord. This is the reason they got punished. Now they defeat them. If you remember Balaam, who couldn't pronounce the curses, right? But you know, he was hired out to do it. He pronounced blessings instead. Even he dies in this account, 1322. And now we get to the division of the land, and here's where y'all stop, (laughs) because it can get monotonous with the names. Most of the rest of the book of Joshua is about the allocation, the division of the land uh, to the 12 tribes of Israel, Joshua and Caleb himself. We hop forward just a little bit into Judges, and we see this about Joshua. After Joshua sent the people away, each of the tribes left to take possession of the land allocated to them, and the Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the leaders who outlived him, those who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at age 110. If you're paying attention, that sounds like someone else with a J name. They buried him in the land... He had been allocated at Timnath Sarah in the hill county of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Now, we often associate the book of Joshua with the phrase, be strong and courageous. But there is another key phrase that is often overlooked and attached to it. If you were picking up what I was putting down, You caught it. If you obey. Yeah, be strong and courageous. If you obey. You will prosper if you obey. Go back to Joshua 1. It says, study this book of instruction continually. That's a lot. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. If you obey. In other words, maybe you shouldn't be so strong and courageous if you are not being obedient. Saw that at AI, right? Before Joshua dies, he tells the Israelites this, Joshua 23, 14, soon I will die, going the way of everything on earth. Deep in your hearts, you know that every promise of the Lord your God has come true. Not a single one has failed. But As surely as the Lord your God has given you the good things he promised, he will also bring disaster on you if you disobey him. He will completely destroy you from this good land he has given you. If you break the covenant of the Lord your God by worshiping and serving other gods, his anger will burn against you and you will quickly vanish from the good land he has given you. Excuse me. 
Did you know that in the Greek, Joshua is Jesus? I'll give a little reminder, but I encourage you, if you're new and you haven't seen it yet, watch the introduction to this series. You can do it through the app or you can do it online. Really important, the introduction and the Bible study following it, where I told you guys that the Bible of the early church was all in Greek. The earliest manuscripts that we have of the Christian Bible are all in Greek, Old Testament and New Testament. The early church fathers believed that it was a superior translation that better pointed to Jesus throughout the series. I've been showing you how it does that. We get more prophecies that way. So a lot of people don't understand that. Greek is very, very important, both Old and New Testament. Now, I want to show you what it looks like, and I don't expect you to be able to read any of that except the stuff up top in blue, but it's interesting. <clears throat> there we see the Greek Old Testament, Joshua chapter 2. Right, so it's talking about uh, the spies. Right, so he's going to send out the spies. The second word there is actually like apostle, to send someone out. But the circled word is Jesus. But our versions read Joshua. That's weird. But then you go to Matthew, this is uh, Jesus being sent in the wilderness to be tempted, there's Jesus. That's weird. What's that all about? Well, we've talked about languages a lot in this series. And so we do our best to try to pronounce the things and then translate them into another language. So in Greek, it's like Isus, right? So we do Jesus. They don't really have like the J sound. Jesus, Isus, sounds similar. Well, in Hebrew which is what most modern Bibles, now we're coming around a little bit, use for the base text of the Old Testament, it says Yeshua. That's what it says, Yeshua. So they made it sound like Joshua. But that's not what they were reading in the early church. And so we get another connection by using the Bible of the early, ch the early church. We get a prefigure of Jesus. And if you were in the early church, if you saw it that way, Ah, it would be a little more obvious to you that he was a prefigure. Interesting little side note for the nerds out there. If you go to Numbers 13 and you look, it says that Joshua's name is Hosea or Hosea. And then if you keep reading, it'll say that Moses calls him, and if you're reading it in Greek, it says Jesus. Pretty interesting. But again, a little more obvious if you're reading the Bible of the early church, that Joshua was a type of Christ. He points to Jesus. He was a foreshadowing in leading the people through the River Jordan, an emblem of baptism or of afflictions or death itself, in which Christ is with his people. He carries them through. In saving Rahab and her family, Christ also saves the worst sinners. In receiving the Gibeonites, who submitted to him. Christ receives all who submit to him. In his conquest of the several kings of the Canaanites, so Christ has conquered the spiritual enemies of his people. In bringing and settling the people in the land of uh, Canaan, their rest and dividing it among them, so Christ brings souls into the true eternal rest. Joshua is a foreshadowing. He is a type of Christ. But only one of them is our Savior. If we go to the best commentary that we have on the Old Testament, that is the New Testament, we see this, Hebrews 4.8. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, this is New Testament, mind you. As the people of Israel did, we will fall. You see, because they weren't completely obedient, they didn't completely conquer the land. You can be strong and courageous if you are obedient. 
And that obedience applies to us as well, says God's word. We like to kind of throw that away, right? The greasy grace thing. I'm saved. Jesus has got me, so I don't need to obey. Not what God's word says. We don't like obedience, do we? It's kind of hard. It's a bad word in church, isn't it? It's like saying repent. Obedience. We hate obedience. We don't like it. Our culture tells us not to be. Our culture preaches rebellion to us, the opposite. We're not supposed to obey anyone or anything. But that's not what God's word says. And you know what? If we're being honest, it can be hard to be strong and courageous, can't it? It can be hard. Sometimes we're afraid, aren't we, if we're being honest? But it's okay to have fear of certain things. I'll show you this. Like roller coasters or dinosaurs. <laughs> the Word of God says we should have fear at times. A lot of people don't know this. It's not popular in the modern church. But it's in Hebrews. This is what it says just before this. <clears throat> For one, we should tremble with fear that some of you may fail to experience it. And I've heard a lot of bad teachings on this. Well, that fear, you know, in the original language is really like reverence. It doesn't really mean fear. Wrong. <laughs> Someone who can read the Greek is speaking right now. Phobia. Think of it like that. Fear. It's just fear. And trembling. That's the word for tremors. Shaking with fear. And it's not just there. It's in other places, not going to be the verse of the day anytime soon. Philippians 2.12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Same type of literally fear, not reverence. Work out your salvation with, you know, just a little bit of reverence for God. That's okay. No, fear him. It's in Ephesians 6. Ah, we love the armor of God, don't we? Go back. Coming from five, there's no chapter breaks in the original. He's talking about familial relationships. Then children, chapter six, goes to slaves. Obey your masters with fear and trembling. Look it up. Ephesians six, probably verse five. Again, same words. New Testament over and over and over again. It says we should have fear of the Lord. In fact, Proverbs tells us it's the beginning of wisdom. To have fear in the Lord. It helps us to obey. Proverbs 14, 16. Here's an interesting one. A lot of you may never have noticed that. That's because it's footnoted. <laughs> the wise are cautious and avoid danger. Fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. A little footnote. I'm glad they put it there, but I wish they just would have translated what it actually says. The wise fear. The wise fear, both in the Hebrew and the Greek. It's phobia in the Greek. Don't know Hebrew very well. Fear. And that's not even in the context of fearing the Lord. It's like Ephesians 6. The context is fearing your masters. There are things that we should have a little intelligent fear over. The Word of God says that's okay. But here's the thing. We must confront it and not lie about it. There's this like little Christianese thing, right? The Bible says don't fear this many times. Right, it says do fear a lot too. Both sides of the coin here. So what we do though, if we're not educated, if we have not read the full counsel of God's word, if you do not have a pastor or teacher teaching you the whole thing, all of it, not just selected verses that make you feel good, you haven't heard this. Many people in church have never seen these verses at all. And so what do we do? We pretend. Ah, well, I'm not afraid because I'm a Christian. I'm doing what the Bible has commanded me to do. Wrong. I told you, you should have some intelligent fear sometimes, especially of the Lord. But we pretend. And when we pretend not to have fear, we all have fear of something. We pretend, and now we have a culture of fake faith. That's what we've developed in the modern church. Fake faith. It's a shame. Unlike Jesus, who took his fears to the Father. 
Use logic. You don't have to read these verses. If you know the story, you know what happened. What did Jesus do? Garden of Gethsemane, what does he do? The night before he knows he's going to get crucified. Would you be scared? Excruciating. They had to make up a word. It's so bad. He knows it's going to happen to him. What does he do? Father, if it's possible, take this cup of suffering from me. I'll translate that for you. I don't want to do this. It says he's horrified and distressed. It's a good translation of that, Holman Christian. Really got it. I don't want to do this. Luke, Dr. Luke, a physician, writing the Gospel of Luke, notes a medical condition he has. He sweats blood. You don't sweat blood because you are happy. You do it because you are terrified. He was terrified. But here's the thing. Our Lord was faithful and obedient to that task. He faced his fear and he gave it to the Father. This is what we need to do. We can't be fake. We can't lie about it. We have to acknowledge it. Let our brothers and sisters come around us, pray for us, help us through it. Instead of being liars, instead of being fake, we have to be like Jesus who was real. Give it to the Father in prayer. That's how we overcome our fears. Jesus was faithful and obedient. The Word of God defines faith as such. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. If we keep reading the best commentary that we have on the Old, old Testament, we see this. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed by the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. We must start by acknowledging our fear, we must then face it so that we can overcome our fears. Complete the task God has set before us with the confidence of Christ. If we keep reading the book of Hebrews, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. How? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. We get to the promised rest by fixing our eyes on Jesus. We must follow his example. Take our fears to the Father. Pick up our cross as he commanded, that which we were afraid of, and carry it, knowing we're enduring, knowing the joy that awaits us. We must follow his example in faithful obedience. We must be strong and courageous by fixing our eyes on Christ. All we need is faith, true faith in him. He who has and always will be faithful, Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, the leveling of Jericho, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, our Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ, because Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen.
Thank you.